In the heart of Paris, a seasoned killer lies in wait within an under-construction apartment opposite a hotel, anticipating his target's arrival without knowing when they'll show. The greatest challenge? The tedium of waiting, a silent threat to his focus. Yet, he's accustomed to it, finding solace in the apartment's seclusion. Aware that his actions barely scratch the surface of life's grand scale, with 1.8 people dying and 4.2 born each second, he engages in music, yoga, and exercise to distract himself and pass the time. Venturing outside, the killer mastered the art of invisibility in a world where true anonymity is a myth. Calm and collected, he merges with every day's regularity, his movements fluid and unnoticed. Picking up his daily protein snacks and receiving a call from his handler. Five days have passed with no target in sight, but he's prepared to wait another 24 hours. Leaving no trace of his existence, he muses over humanity's evolution from survival of the fittest to a baseless collective trust in our shared goodness. On his return to the apartment, he contemplates the age-old dynamic of the few exploiting the many, a fundamental aspect of civilization. He reminds himself to ensure he's among the few, not the many. Still no sign of his target. In the thick of the evening, he meticulously sets up his rifle, the quiet disrupted by the sudden click of the door lock. A false alarm, merely male. His prolonged stay has stretched his patience thin. He allows himself some time to rest, waking up multiple times every hour to check on whether his target has arrived, when finally the arrival of a maid, followed by his target, catapults him into action. Music serves two purposes, distraction from thoughts and sharpening of his focus. His actions are methodical, devoid of personal conviction. Empathy is a luxury he cannot afford. Finally lining up a shot, he fires, but his intended target survives, it's time to get out without leaving any trace. Amidst rising panic, he acts calm, swiftly erasing any ties to the scene. His escape is calculated, blending into the city's rhythm as he meticulously disposes of incriminating evidence. A gas station provides a momentary refuge for him to eliminate any traces of gunpowder residue, a change of clothes aiding his disguise. A close call with a detection dog at the airport tests his composure, but with a fake identity, he slips through. After his unsuccessful mission, he contacts his handler, who is understandably upset. He has to lay low. In his line of job he always has to be alert and to avoid any chances. Noticing the same suspicious man waiting for his next flight, he decides to delay his departure to the Dominican Republic. Opting for safety, he confines himself to his room, taking all necessary precautions to remain alert to any signs of intrusion. Landing on the next flight brings him a momentary peace, believing he's evaded any tales. Yet, as he nears his secluded estate, a cluster of cigarette butts signals caution. Opting for stealth, he approaches on foot, discovering more unsettling signs, unfamiliar footprints and blaring music. Inside, the evidence of a struggle and significant bloodshed makes him dash to the hospital, where he finds his wife critically injured, under urgent care. Her brother reveals the assault by two intruders, one was a woman. They arrived by green taxi and a detail about her injuring the man's leg. They weren't there to rob the place. The killer promises to take care of it. His wife awakens and says that despite the intruder's efforts, she revealed nothing. Her resilience fuels his determination, leading him to dig up a hidden safe equipped with all he needs to seek out and eliminate those responsible for her suffering. He spends hours driving around the island looking for a green taxi. Eventually, he finds it and tracks it to where it's based. There, he digs up details on the taxi's recent trips and the driver, making it seem like a theft to cover his tracks. He shadows the cab driver, holding him accountable for bringing work to his house. Getting into Leo's taxi and putting on a silencer, he lets Leo know his intentions. Leo thinks it's a robbery, but the killer wants to know about the incident at his estate. Leo spills the beans about the pair, a tough guy and a Q-tip woman. He mentions that they look like killers as they reach an isolated area. Although Leo pleads for mercy, the killer ensures no ends are left untied. Lacking solid leads, he flies to New Orleans to confront his handler. He rents out a van, driving to his privately owned storage unit, filled to the brim with everything a killer would ever need. Disguised as a sanitation worker to bypass tight security, he waits for FedEx to arrive to ensure an easy entrance. Timing the automated doors, he enters right after a FedEx employee leaves. In a tense confrontation at Edward's office, the killer demands information about those who harmed his wife, disregarding Edward's attempts to reason with him about a job failure and refusal to disclose names. The killer believes the crucial information is stored physically in Edward's office, rejecting any digital storage as too risky. Despite Edward's resistance, the killer resorts to using a nail gun, leading to Edward's accidental death due to a miscalculation in the intimidation tactic. No biggie, just have to get rid of the body, and the witness. Dolores has the names he's looking for, her only demand is to stage her death as accidental, so her children can get her life insurance. Despite his motto being forbid empathy, he can't help himself. As they prepare to leave with the body, on the elevator a man makes a joke about a body, to which Dolores can't help but laugh. Awkward. Arriving at Dolores' home, he scouts it out and despite her already accepting her fate, she still wants to live, but it's no use. She tells him that after the mess in Paris, the client has sent two hitmen after him.
With this info, he knows who he needs to deal with next. Now all that's left is to tie his loose end. Staged as accidental death. Body cleanup is labor intensive. It's hard to solve a puzzle if you scatter the pieces. That's why he measures twice and cuts once. Scattering the remains all over, then leaving the rental spotless. With nothing to come back to him. His next destination is Florida. These kinds of people always have a pit bull. He has his ways to deal with the dog. Before he can act, he needs rest. Awakening to a loud horn, he stalks the car out and identifies his target by a limp. After a long night out, the tough guy finally returns. Time to set his plan in motion. He throws chunks of meat over the fence, but the dog is cautious, but not cautious enough. About 10 to 15 minutes later, the barking stops. Now he has free passage. Since the dog is out cold, he quietly makes his way inside and hears a shower running. Tiptoeing towards it, he sweeps his angles. While the tough guy is using the fan he makes his way into the next room, but is suddenly ambushed and loses the gun. In terms of physical strength the tough guy one-ups him, throwing the killer around like a ragdoll and beating him up. The killer opts for a less direct approach, grabbing everything around him and smashing the tough guy's head. But the man is a tank. The tough guy flips a table on him, grabbing a gun, but is promptly seated. With only a grating utensil to work with, the odds aren't looking good for my guy. However, he uses it to create a distraction, allowing him to stealthily navigate the house and use the element of surprise to his advantage. The tough guy is tapped, but the dog has awakened, eager to avenge his owner. However, it's already too late, the killer is out. To mask his trail, he molotovs the house. One down, two to go. With his next flight to New York, he uses any moment he can to relax and get some rest. After renting a car, the killer stakes out his next target, nicknamed Q-Tip due to her appearance. He drives up to her at an intersection, contemplating a quick kill, but a police siren thwarts his plan. She enters a high-end restaurant, and breaking his usual caution, he follows, signaling his intentions without words. She knows it's about the Dominican Republic thing. She goes into a monologue with him, asking for a few drinks before her removal, but the killer doesn't even budge. She offers him a drink, showing that it's not tainted. She apologizes for his female friend, she had no part of it for what it's worth. He could have killed her in any way without ever exposing himself. She could scream, she'd still end up dead. He would make it out, but not clean. She wants to know why he took this risk, confronting her head on. She thinks he's here, because he wanted to feel reassured, like he felt when he shouldered his sniper rifle and somehow, missed. He finally slurps the whiskey, she's correct. They go outside and she keeps telling him how he will remember this conversation when it will be his time to be removed. Walking in high heels, she trips, asking for his help, but he finally finishes the job, sticking to trusting no one. Last one is the client, Claiborne. Risky, but he doesn't care. Tracking Claiborne isn't hard, the vanity plates help and everything about him gives up his next move. The garage back door is closed, but he can work around it, ordering a fob copier. At the gym Claiborne uses, the killer signs up for a one-week trial, noticing the janitor's all-access key. Considering this will be his last job, he transfers all of his money from American banks and aliases to offshore accounts. No loose ends. Finding an underground gun seller in America isn't hard, they're like weed and finally receiving his fob copier, he's ready to execute. He arrives at the gym and blatantly snatches the all-access key from a janitor. In the locker room, he just waits for Claiborne to start his workout session. The killer uses the janitor's key to open Claiborne's locker and copies Guy's penthouse key with the fob copier, leaving it back where he found it. Everything he went through, from Paris till now, was all because of Claiborne and he has steps from ending it all. Using the copied key, he enters through the back door. With determination in his eyes, the killer marches towards Claiborne's room. Meanwhile Claiborne is on the phone, yapping, but hangs up at the request of the killer. Claiborne's first impression is that it's a robbery, but it's not about that. The killer is here to show how easily he can get to him and wants to know, do they have a problem? Turns out Claiborne, who both hired the killer and paid extra to have him rubbed out after he failed the job, completely has forgotten about it. It's all just business for him. Only after seeing the address of the Paris job, he understands what's going on. Claiborne emphasizes that they have no issue, since he has already moved past it. It's amazing how Claiborne couldn't even figure out why a guy would be at his place with a gun in the middle of the night. The killer warns him though, if he has to come back, his death will be slow and painful. He's done with his mission, dispersing the names. Finally back in the Dominican Republic he can enjoy the feeling of security. In the end, maybe he isn't one of the few, he's one of many. Thank you for watching. Subscribe for more videos like this.